Well, we're in session 17 of our review of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to focus on chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, as it's commonly called. I'd like to say right up front, before we go any further, that this is one of the most important prophetic passages in the New Testament on the one hand, but it's also one of the most misunderstood passages in the New Testament. Not so much because of Matthew, but because of the presumption that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all are recording the same discourse. You'll find them called the Olivet Discourse in most study Bibles, all three, three accounts. And if we read it very carefully, all we're going to do is read it very carefully, fill you in some background as we go, and you come to your own conclusions. But I'll prepare you in advance that many people are misinformed about the Luke account. And that's what we're going to try to highlight. So let's just jump in. Christ's major discourse in the New Testament are four. The Sermon on the Mount, the Manifesto of the Kingdom. The Mystery Parables Discourse in Matthew 13. Then we have the Olivet Discourse that we're focusing on tonight. And the Upper Room Farewell Address in the Gospel of John, 14 through 17. These are four of the major discourses in the New Testament. And obviously, three of the four are in the Gospel of Matthew. And we suspect that part of that is because Matthew took shorthand. It was a required skill for a customs inspector. And so he was taking these down in verbatim. And tonight we're going to focus on the Olivet Discourse as recorded in Matthew 24. It's typically listed as re being recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Mark 13, the account there is, with the exception of probably about two verses, is identical to the Matthew account. We'll highlight those two verses as we go through. The real distinctives are between Matthew and Luke, Luke 21, which we'll deal in the subsequent session. Let's first of all just go through and read it to get the flavors. I'm sure more very familiar to you that as uh, students of prophecy, but let's just warm up by reading it through. Matthew 24, verse 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. In previous chapters, you recall, he had just cleansed the temple, drove out the money changers, and so forth. So he departed from there. The disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Great questions. Great questions. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. It's interesting. He always opens and closes these passages with the admonition, Don't be deceived. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. That see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes, and divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. 
For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. For verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the, also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and he shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's Matthew 24, our first sweep through to get the flavor of what I believe is a familiar passage to most of you. I want to do the same thing with the Luke passage. Just skim it through. You'll notice the similarities, and you'll also know some things that are a little different. And let's take a look at Luke. Luke chapter 21, starting about verse 5. As some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the, the, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall be there be from heaven. But before all these, they, they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my, my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but the, there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations and with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and with drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. So that's the Luke passage. Obviously very similar in many respects, and yet there are some differences that the more you study, the more disturbing they become. What are some of the issues? Well, the destruction of Jerusalem. It turns out the dis dis discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem is very different in both accounts. Is it the d destruction in 70 AD that's a major landmark in Jewish history? Or is it an event yet future? And the abomination of desolation that Matthew talks about, what on earth is that all about? What is it? When did it happen? Or has it not happened yet? The great tribulation, the parable of the fig tree, these are all issues that prophecy buffs argue about. And it talks about this generation shall not pass away. Which generation is he talking about? And this doctrine of eminence underlays all of this, that he could come at any moment both to the world and also to us individually. It has a number of implications. So these are some of the issues that lurk behind our understanding of this critical passage given by the Lord himself. Let's back up a little bit and review what I like to call uh, the epistemology. And that's simply the study of knowledge at scope and limits. How do we know that anything is true? Jesus says, be not deceived. He says at the beginning and the end of each discourse. Well, great. How do we prevent? How do we keep from being deceived? How do you go about it? What are your tools? And uh, we, we live in a culture in which the information we get from our administration and from the press has been proven to be unreliable. Okay, how do you find out what's really going on? How do you know what's really true? And uh, well, in what we're do doing here, first of all, you establish the integrity of the Word of God by discovering its integrity. That, that, that you got 66 books penned by 40 guys over several thousand years that are an integrated message. Once you discover that, then you'd also discover that the origin had to come from outside time itself, outside uh, uh, the, the dimensions that we normally experience. Once you establish that, it's that collection, that, that integrated message that establishes the identity of Jesus Christ. Mel Gibson in his movie The Passion did a marvelous job in many respects but it led to two areas of confusion. It created the impression that the crucifixion was a tragedy. It was an achievement that was planned before the foundation of the world. The second thing it failed to do is identify who Jesus Christ really is. Not just a great teacher or a great religious leader. Quite the contrary. He's the most anti-religious person who ever walked the earth. So once you establish the identity of the scripture, then with that you establish Christ. And then from that, you carefully understand precisely what he said. Find out what he actually said and address that with a, a great care and precision. Our epistemologic approach is to establish the identity of the, the integrity of the design, which establishes the identity of Jesus Christ, and he then, of course, identifies, authenticates the whole package. That's our epistemological model, in effect. So we've got, under hermeneutics, which is your theory of interpretation, we do recognize that there are all kinds of rhetorical devices in the text. Some of those are allegorical. Some of those are meta similes, metaphors. There's 200 different uh, rhetorical devices in the scripture. But we need to understand when we see a, historical dev a, a rhetorical device, is it allegorical or is it to be taken literally? Those are issues. Are these uh, 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 things that look similar, are they parallel or are they distinctives? Are those distinctives deliberate? We need to decide those things. 
And uh, are we dealing in precision or approximations? I've learned painfully over my 60 years of studying the Bible, I never use the word approximate in God in the same sentence. His precision is astonishing. The more you know about the languages, the more astonishing it becomes. So we obviously have a very high view of the text, as it might be said scholastically, and we draw that from Matthew 5, 17 and 18, where Jesus himself says, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's a call to taking the text very, very precisely. You test your views always against the context, but the real context is the whole counsel of God, not just the local context. The ultimate context is the whole counsel of God. And it's an integrated, deliberate design, and once you discover that, it'll change your whole approach to your Bible studies. The ultimate challenge to your hermeneutics is your eschatology. The ultimate challenge to your theories of interpretation is how comprehensive do you understand God's whole plan of redemption? The first branch in the road you come to, there are those that believe that the millennium, Christ's literal rule on the earth, is just an allegorical kind of illusion. And there are those that are pre-millennial that believe the millennium that the Bible talks about is very literal, very specific, that Jesus will literally rule the planet earth from the throne of David for a thousand years. That's the first divide. I'm guessing my numbers, but I would suspect that over 90% of people who call themselves Christians in the United States would be amillennial. Most, most classical denominations are. Those that are considered fundamentalists as crackpots like ourselves are premillennial. There, are, there were groups in the past called post-millennial. They felt the millennial had already started, but that view is, uh, uh, became very um, uh, shredded by the experience of the 20th century, which is the bloodiest century of all mankind. And uh, so the idea that millennium's already started is, 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 there's still a fringe group that thinks so, but I don't think that's a serious contender today. There's a variation of amillennialism called preterism, which says all prophecy has been fulfilled already. And they're on the rise, strangely enough, in our culture. And uh, one of their major arguments is their use, or I might say abuse, of Matthew 24. So we'll be dealing with that in a sense as we go into these, through this text. Among the premillennial types, of course, the question then is, when does the rapture take place? Is it before, during, or at the end of the tribulation? And uh, uh, we take the view that the, the rapture will occur before the 70th week of Daniel, so it's certainly before the tribulation. And that's a, but that's an area that good scholars have diff different views on. But if you are on the left side of this chart, as most denominations are, then you would be post-tribulational or millennial in your perspectives, whether you knew those names or not. If you are uh, extremists like we are and take the Bible very seriously, then you tend to be on the right side of this chart and uh, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. The main point I'm making here, though, isn't to sell you a particular viewpoint. is to point out where you end up on this chart is a function of your hermeneutics. If you have a great willingness to allegorize Scripture, take it just symbolically as as great moral points rather than specifically actually happening, uh, that would put you on the left side of the chart. If you take, have a tendency to take the Bible very precisely, very seriously, I'll use the term literally, uh, rec still acknowledging there are figures of speech, obviously, uh, that would put you on the right side of the chart. So that's a little background. But one of the things you'll discover as you study your Bible are hazards of your presuppositions. We all bring presuppositions to a study, and those presuppositions can be hazardous. One of the major hazards that we bring to any study is our own traditions and what I call tangled tethers. How far are you willing to stray from the text itself? There was, of course, originally Mosaic Judaism. These, these, these were people who believed in the Torah, the laws of Moses, directly. We'll call that, for lack of a better term, Mosaic Judaism, the Judaism of the Old Testament. But as time went on, there were those that embraced what they called the oral law. They added to what Moses wrote with other rules, 613 of them actually, and they end up being codified in a thing called the Talmud in the 3rd through the 6th centuries A.D. And uh, the Pharisaical Judaism is what Christ, when he uh, shows up, he preaches against. Many of the conflicts in the New Testament are his rebuttal of these uh, uh, self-imposed rules that weren't, were, did violence to what God intended as he expressed himself through Moses. And the tension between Pharisaical Judaism and, and Mosaic Judaism 
is in part what accounts for those confrontations that we've encountered in the Gospel of Matthew already. As you get after the fall of the temple, fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, the, the Judaism has a huge problem because they've been taught that by the shedding of blood, only by the shedding of blood is remission of sins, and now there's no place to shed blood, there's no temple, there's no altar. They had to redefine Judaism. So they, they had the Council of Yomni in 90 AD, which began this trend to redefining Judaism to what we see today in large measure would be more properly called Talmudic Judaism. They spend more time studying the Talmud than they do the text itself. So the point I'm getting here is the tether is getting a little longer each stage, going from the written law to the oral law, and then from that oral law to the written down oral law called the Talmud. It went further. And when you get to the 12th century, you have the rise of the writings of the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, which goes even further. In fact, it actually even inverts some of the teachings of Moses. It, it literally is an attempt to unveil the Father's nakedness where they're speaking of the Godhead itself. And uh, so the tether is getting so bad that there was a reaction to some of that that led to the Hasidic Judaism in the 18th century, six centuries later. But each step of these things involves what I call tangled tethers. They're using the anchor of the text. Their, their tether from that anchor is getting too long. They get themselves tangled up into their own uh, definitions. So that's, that we're all victims of traditions. This is just one chain that is relevant to our studies. They drift away from the original anchor of the text itself. We now know from computerized studies that God gave Moses the Torah letter by letter. It has properties that only are sustained by not omitting a single letter. But there's another danger that we have, perhaps more subtle, but one I want you to be aware of, and that's where we harmonize the scripture. We find two accounts that are different but similar enough, we assume they're the same account that one of the two writers just didn't quite get it right. Are they really recording the same thing or not? Most of those are in the, in the periphery, not really serious. But the Olivet Discourse is one of them. Is it past or is it future? The preterist would have you believe it deals with things of the past. And yet... Uh, uh, that has some problems we're going to take a look at. The Olivet Discourse, is it really the same briefing in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Or are they several briefings in, with different audiences and different emphasis? We'll see. I want you to imagine that you had a cheap telescope, you point up to the sky and you see a star. But you're kind of dissatisfied with the fuzzy optics of your cheap telescope, so you go to a fancy store and you spend a lot of money and get a really fancy telescope, and you look at that same star with good optics, and you discover something very surprising. That that star you were looking at is not a single star, it's actually two stars close together. There is a mathematical property of optics called resolving power. Better optics have the ability to resolve more precisely things that are very close together. That's basically what an optician means by resolving power. And I'm going to suggest to you that when we try to crunch several different passages and assume it's really the same incident, we run the risk of losing some precision, some insight. It may be the subject of error. By, uh, we're going to discover that Matthew 24 and Luke 21 have a common, a set of common elements. The main one being this cluster of events that Matthew labels the beginning of sorrows. Both of them talk about several things. That's one of them, several others. So they have some things in common, but they also have some things that are distinctively different. We're going to try to take a look at that. So let's first of all go through the Olivet Discourse as Matthew records it. Mark's is exactly the same thing with the exception of a couple of verses I'll highlight as we go. So we're basically looking at two together, Matthew and Mark together here. Let's go back and look at this again as Matthew chapter 24, chapter 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to him show the buildings of the temple, obviously with great pride. They're all excited about this. And Jesus said to them, See, not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That must have come as a shock to them. This was a source of stability. This was a temple that uh, uh, had a history. In fact, it was a divinely appointed place with divinely appointed priests following divinely appointed procedures. It was incomprehensible that God would allow this to be destroyed in their minds. That's what Jesus is saying. 
So this raises another question. So as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. I want you to notice the reason we call it the Olivet Discourse is the, the, the location where it was recorded was on the Mount of Olives. I want you to notice that they came to him privately. Only four, not twelve, four guys came. Peter, James, and John, and Peter's brother Andrew. This is a private insider's briefing. It's important to understand. Came to him privately, saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Good questions. The disciples came to him privately, not twelve, four guys. Okay. If you look at the Mark account that's parallel to this, as he went out of the temple, one of the disciples said, Master, see what manner of stones and buildings are here. Jesus answering and said, Seest thou these great buildings, there shall not be left one stone upon another, shall not be, th not be thrown down. Notice what Mark says in the next verse. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, just these four guys, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled. That's the only difference in the Matthew and Mark account. Let's go back a little further here now. I want you to realize that Jesus had a lot of followers probably in the hundreds, especially at this time because they all heard about Lazarus and what have you. So that's the general public. That's outside that. There's groups that are his followers that are, uh, after Matthew 12, he, he speaks to the public only in parables. But inside his total followers there's a group called the 70 we read about. But inside that 70 there are the 12. You even use that as a title when there's only 11. After Judas departs they still call it the 12, but that's a, it means, or it's really the 11 as we would say. And of course, within the 12, there's an inner circle, right? And that inner circle consists of three guys that were present with Jairus' daughter when she was raised from the dead. These three guys are at the Transfiguration in Matthew 17. These three will be in an inner circle at Gethsemane, a little closer than the rest. And of course, these three plus Andrew, J uh, Peter's brother, are at the Olivet Discourse. So this is what we're talking about, the in inner circle. That's the point I'm trying to get across. Okay, so to this inner circle, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Christ is a title, claiming to be the Messiah. Not the Messiah of Israel necessarily, but the, the, the Messiah that's coming on the world here. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. It fascinates me how many people use wars and rumors of wars as signs. They're non-signs. This, that, and the other thing that happened, but the end is not yet, he says. He's going to show you signs in a minute. That's not one of them. Because he goes on to say, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, or the, actually the... the uh, the label in the Greek is birth pangs. Sorrow is like a woman has in labor, increasing in intensity and increasing in frequency. This group of signs is referred to by both writers, Luke and Matthew. I'm going to cluster these and call them the beginning of sorrows. It's a group, okay? National shows against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Why am I doing that? Because they are listed consistently in three interesting places. The false cries, the wars, the famines, pestilence, earthquakes are in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 9. They're also the same list as in Luke 21, verse 4 through 24, in effect. And Revelation opens in chapter 6 with the first dozen verses listing those same things using slightly different idioms. But again, you've got the white horseman, the red horseman, the black horseman, and so forth, right? Okay, so these are, I'm going to call the beginning of sorrows to give them a, a cluster, a label, okay? Now what Matthew records, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Very key word here. See that word then? Underline that in your Bible. It's going to be important later. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Gee, that's wonderful news. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Okay? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And my wife pointed out to me the word love there is agapeo. The, love, the agape of many shall wax cold. The lack of love 
within the Christian body is a sign of the times. I was shocked to get that prophecy lesson from my wife who's dedicated her ministry on that issue. Love within the body. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Then you get to verse 15, and the identical verse is in Mark 13, verse 14. Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see... The abomination of desolation, key word, we're going to talk about that, sp spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now that verse is very precious to me. Because Daniel, I mean that uh, Jesus here has saved you hours of boring library research. The book of Daniel happens to be one of the best documented books of the Old Testament. There's more support for that book that if you want to dig it out, but you don't need to. Who wrote the book of Daniel? Daniel did. Was it Daniel the prophet? Yes. How do I know? Jesus told me. That saves me all that trouble. I don't have, to, I don't have any doubt about that anymore. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have no doubt about the authenticity of the book of Daniel. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got a lot bigger problems than the authenticity of the book of Daniel. When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that, now, he speaks of it, by the way, in Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, Daniel 12. Daniel speaks a lot about this abomination of desolation. Stand in the holy place, the holy of holies. Let me define this right now. We'll get into it a little more, but I want to just get this right out of the way because there's more confusion about what is the abomination of desolation. The word abomination throughout the Bible is something God detests. detests. It's abomination. It's something God detests. What is it that he detests? Idol worship. Worshiping anything other than worshiping the living God is an abomination to him. The abomination of desolation is the ultimate, most insulting form of that. You not only erect an idol and worship it, you worship it on the most holy spot on the planet earth. That's in Jerusalem, in the temple, in fact, in the holy place, in fact, in the holy of holies. It has only happened once before in history. And because it has happened in the past, we know a lot about it. Stand in the holy place. And then you have this interesting verse, or passage. Whoso readeth, let him understand. How many of you read that verse off the screen during the study? Can I see a show of hands? Come on, let's see him high. Okay, I played a dirty trick on you. You see, this verse is not for theologians or pastors. It's for everybody that had their hand up. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. You have incurred an obligation to understand what this highly technical, highly precise verse is saying. Jesus is telling his believers, his disciples, when ye therefore shall see, it's something they're going to be able to see. Well, that's confusing. The abomination of desolation, that's an idol, a pagan idol in the Holy of Holies, which is spoken by Daniel the prophet at least in four places. Stand in the Holy Place. How can, now the holy place is a place that only the high priest can enter and only once a year and only after great ceremonial preparation. It's called Yom Kippur. If only the high priest can go in there and only on once a year, how can you as somebody in Judea see this going on? Anyone? CNN, exactly. This will be a televised, this strangely enough, this may sound like I'm being flippant. I'm not. This is actually includes within it a prediction of global television. There's going to be several of those throughout the Bible, by the way. Let's move on. We need a little background because the, the, the abomination of desolation occurred in the past. There was a guy by the name of Antiochus IV. He was the son of Antiochus III, who was known as Antiochus the, Antiochus the Great. He became the successor of his brother, Seleucus IV, who had been murdered by his minister, and the king of Syria. Um, Antiochus IV was a despot, highly eccentric, highly unpredictable, unreliable, very cruel, astonishingly cruel, and tyrannical. He adopted the nickname Epiphanes, which is an abbreviation of the Greek uh, Theos Epiphanes, which is a designation he gave himself. What it means is the God who appears or reveals himself. You get some insight into his humility by the label he picks up. 
But he becomes, by the way, in the book of Daniel, a foreshadowing of the final world ruler, by the way. That's why there are passages, especially in chapter 11, from, uh, from verse 36 through about 40 is about Antiochus IV, but from 40 on, it's obviously speaking of a future echo of that guy in the future. Antiochus undertook the total eradication of the Jewish religion. He was a, he was a, a Seleucid Empire, a Greek, um, and he wanted to establish the Greek polyth polytheism instead of the Judaism of the Jews. And he decided to do that by force. The observance of all Jewish laws, especially of those that relate to the Shabbat and to the circumcision, were forbidden under pain of death. If you circumcised your children, you were subject to the death penalty. Think about that as a parent. To be faithful, you need to circumcise your kids. But that would be something, that would leave evidence that would be actioned upon by monthly visits of the officers of Antiochus. If you tried to observe the Sabbath, you were, had the same result. All Jewish practices were set aside in all the cities of Judea, and sacrifices were ordered to be submitted against pagan deities. And representatives of the crown were everywhere to enforce these edicts. Once a month, a search was instituted, and whoever secreted a copy of the, the Torah or had observed the rite of circumcision was condemned to death. These were tough times. These were tough times. In Jerusalem on the 15th of Kislev, in December of 168, he broke the league that he had made. He apparently had made an agreement with the leadership in Jerusalem. But he apparently violated that league. A pagan altar was built upon the great altar in the, of burnt sacrifices in the temple. And he stripped the temple of its treasuries. This is all recorded in Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews, book 7, verse 4. He pillaged them the city of Jerusalem, took 10,000 captives, compelled them to forsake their worship, forbid circumcision, crucified violators. The Torah was forbidden and destroyed. This also is recorded by uh, Josephus in Antiquities Volume 12. On the 25th of Kislev, which happens to be Antiochus' birthday, and it, it, interestingly enough, becomes commemorated by all Jewish families ever since, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. On his birthday, he brought a sacrifice on this altar for the first time. He had offered a swine in every village, that's Josephus points that out, the first, the other one's in Maccabees. He erected an idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies, which Maccabees, 1st Maccabees calls a desolating sacrilege. 2nd Maccabees calls it, 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 made it, made it thus the temple to Jupiter Olympius. And this was the abomination of desolation. Why do I call it that? Because there, a spontaneous revolt occurs. Um, there was a bunch of officers arrived to carry out Antiochus' decrees at the village of Modain, where an aged priest named Mathathias lived with his five sons. Mathathias was a devout Jew, obviously. He immediately killed the first Jew that approached the pagan altar to offer the sacrifice, and he also killed the royal official who presided. And he and his sons, he and his five sons, obviously fled to the hills, as they now were fugitives. Now this little spontaneous incident gets blossoms into a full-scale war. His five sons were, of course, the nucleus of these gang of rebels. The five sons were John, Simon, Judas, Eleazar, and Jonathan. They had nicknames. Judas' nickname that was Gadai, Phasai, Maccabeus, and Averon, and Apis. But the leader, it's clear that Judas of these five sons was, had great military aptitude and skills. His nickname happened to be Maccabeus, the hammer. Gives you some idea of his athletic prowess that he apparently earned before all this happened. But he then becomes the leader of this revolt. And the revolt in general are then known as the Maccabeans, after Judas's nickname. Their last name really had to do with Hasmoneans. You, some people can't link up. Why, what, why did the Maccabean revolt, which was successful, lead to the Hasmoneans? That was the family name. The Maccabean is a nickname of Judas, who was the, the big leader here at the time. Matthias, the aged priest, soon died after their leaving the leadership in the hands of Judas. And uh, so he, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. And this guerrilla war then uh, turned into full military engagements. And they managed to defeat the more powerful Syrian armies. They actually threw off the yoke of the Seleucid Empire. 
And that leads to what's called the Hasmonean period. He did a lot of things. He captured Jerusalem. He uh, rededicated the temple. It took three years. It's the third year on the anniversary of its desecration that they rededicate the temple on the 25th of Kislev. And that is honored by the Jewish community every 25th of Kislev since then. It's called Hanukkah. We always associate Hanukkah with the colorful legends that surround. Just It's analogous to talking about Santa Claus and Christmas in a sense. They have some colorful legends about Hanukkah. But set that aside for the moment. The real issue is they're celebrating the rededication of the temple. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's authorized in the New Testament, by the way. In John chapter 10, verse 22, the New Testament makes allusion to Hanukkah. And I think the Holy Spirit did that to make you do your homework on this background. Now, Antiochus death also took place in 164. So that's a, that's a great year by any accounting. Okay. Now, he continued uh, successfully to press what was now a war for independence. His last great victory was over the force of Nicanor, Beth Horon. Beth Horon was the same place that Joshua had the sun stand still and all that. And that was in March of 161 BC. That leads to what we call the Hasmonean period. And uh, that endures until Pompey conquers Judea on behalf of the Romans in 63 BC. So it, it lasts about a century of what we call the Hasmonean period. Okay. So here we have the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Now here's, here's the problem. Jesus is talking this at about 32 AD. But he says, he's speaking of it as a future event. When ye shall see. So it's something coming. But what we know about it, if you were Jewish at that time, that word conjures up a memory of a couple of, cent you know, a couple of centuries ago. I want you to get that clear in your mind. I think I've got a little chronology here. Visualize this as a timeline. Daniel's prophecy was, call it, the 5th fifth, fifth century B.C., just ahead of the return when they were freed, the, the Persians conquered Babylon and freed them to go home. That occurs about 539 B.C. Daniel's prophecy was written just in advance of that, obviously. The abomination and desolation took place in 167 B.C., Right? So that, and the Septuagint, in the meantime, the Septuagint, in the middle of the 3rd century, 270 B.C., the Septuagint's translated. Just to give you a feeling of the chronology here, okay? Daniel's prophecy, they get freed, they come back to the land. Under, the Persian, under, the, uh, uh, under Ptolemy Philadelphus, they translate the he, Old Testament into Greek. That's called the Septuagint, 270 B.C. We're now get, we, as time moves, we're now at 167 B.C., where we have this event that we just talked about. Jesus is talking here about 32 AD, so all this is history. You with me so far? But Jesus is making reference to an abomination of desolation. I'm going to call it abomination of desolation number two. Because he's talking about something that hasn't happened that is mirrored in advance in, in by Antiochus Epiphanes. Are we together on that? The reason we're so comfortable about knowing it, because it happened in the past, and Jesus himself is making reference to it. In fact, he links Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse points you to Daniel to unravel prophecy. Jesus is pointing his insiders to Daniel chapter 9 as the key to end time prophecy. Now we've just been through all that. This is, I'm just trying to tie it all together for you. Okay. So we have a term that Paul uses called the fullness of the Gentiles referring to the church. Because after, after Jesus is, resur is resurrected and then ascended, we have the, the church is born at the Feast of Shavuot or Feast of Pentecost as we call it. It was born in a miracle. It will end in a miracle. That period of time, Paul uses the phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 11.25. Don't confuse that. And obviously, by the way, that leads to the tribulation. Don't confuse that term with the times of the Gentiles, which starts with Nebuchadnezzar and ends with the Antichrist. The times of the Gentiles, Luke uses in this thing to refer to Gentile dominion on the planet Earth, and it will be consummated with the Antichrist. So don't let those two terms confuse you. But obviously after the tribulation comes Armageddon, the Lord intervenes, sets up his kingdom. And we're going to focus shortly on this peculiar period of time called the 70th week, which is split into two, three and a half year period. Remember when we talked about Daniel 70 weeks, we had 69 weeks that predicted the exact day that Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem. Then there's an interval. Verse 25 of the 69 weeks, we dealt with that. Verse 27 will deal with the last of the 70th weeks, the 70th week. 
There is an interval between the two, verse 26, during which the Messiah is executed and which the temple is destroyed. These things happen after the riding of the donkey, presenting himself as king, and yet they occur before the 70th week. There's a discontinuity, there's an interval, a gap, if you will. And that gap includes the church. The 70th week is verse 27. And a lot of the detail there we've talked about in the past. It's defined by a covenant being enforced by the world leader. That's what defines us. It does not define by the rapture. That apparently occurs sometime prior to that. Many people get, they assume he signs a treaty. That's not what it says. He enforces a covenant. Maybe he does sign a treaty. Maybe he just enforces the Palestinian covenant. Who knows? In the middle of that seven-year period is when we have this abomination of desolation. And Jesus himself labels that last half of that seven-year period the Great Tribulation. His label, not mine. It's three, three and a half years, not seven. In fact, each half of this seven-year period is labeled. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. In Old Testament and the New Testament, both. Most documented period of time in the Bible. Are we together so far? Okay. When you see the abomination of desolation, Jesus says, you split and you split now. He says, then let them which be in Judea, not L.A. or Paris or whatever, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the house, housetop not pack his things. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. How much clearer can he be? When you know this has happened, you split and you split now. Woe unto them that are with child or to them which give suck in those days. If you're a woman with a baby, you've got a problem. Because you're not going to be able to move fast enough, apparently. And pray that your flight be not in the winter. You know that Judea sometimes is impassable in winter. We were there when it snowed. Neither on the Sabbath day. Now there's a clue. Is he talking to Gentiles or is he talking to Jews? He's talking to Jews. Pray that your flight be not in the winter or in the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day you've got a problem. For then, here's another then, mark it. For then shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. That's a technology statement. You may not realize it until you think about it. If you were studying this during the Civil War, you could not imagine that kind of chaos coming from muskets and bayonets. This is a technology statement. The nuclear cloud overhangs every geopolitical decision on the planet Earth today. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for your elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. If God didn't intervene some way, man would wipe himself out. That's what he's saying. That's a technology statement, among other things. Great Tribulation. Jesus is labeling this period himself. He's quoting from Daniel 12. If you look at Daniel 12. At that, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such was never since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. A promise that's um, given to him by a messenger in the last couple of three chapters of Daniel, the climax of Daniel. Time of trouble, such as never was since that. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus is calling it the great tribulation. Jeremiah uses a similar kind of phrase. He says, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a Jewish label for the great tribulation. It's worldwide, but it focuses on the Jews. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, where there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and show, show great signs on television and, no, I'm saying, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect behold I have told you before wherefore if they say unto you behold he is in the desert go not forth if he is in the secret chambers believe it not for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west so shall also the coming of the son of man be for wheresoever the carcasses, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's one phrase that I can't find any of the conservative scholars that will tell you what that means. All of them in their privacy will admit they scratch their head. There are a number of conjectures, but all of them are attackable. 
So this is not one to finally resolve. One can view it like where the body is, there will be his eagles gathered together. That's one view. But the idiom is a very strange one because the carcass is, sounds like a dead carcass and uh, the uh, eagles are, are, are vultures, are not eagles like we think of them. So as you, as you analyze this into the text, it's not helpful. At least it apparently is a phrase that needs uh, more illumination. I've talked to um, all the great scholars I know and, and all of them have conjectures, but none that are really uh, conclusively... Uh, I personally suspect that it alludes to that uh, where his body is, we will all be gathered with him. But that's, that's, con that's con presumptuous. But here's another one. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's a very key phrase, some interesting things happen. See, the preterists would say this has already happened. Oh, really? Then the sun was darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Not so you'd notice, you see. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's not the rapture. That's the coming in power and great glory. And uh, so the, uh, and the, the rapture phrase may emerge from a better understanding of that previous verse, but I can't prove it to you today. But the main point is, the preterists have to take this verse and just make it allegorical. Because they can't escape the fact that it says immediately after tribulation, if that's already passed, gee, then the sun's moon, the sun and the moon is darkened, and stars fall, and powers of heaven shaken, and the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth mourn. I haven't noticed that anywhere. No, I don't think that this is where the preterists uh, insist, but it falls apart immediately after. So again, we have the covenant enforced, the 70th week. Second coming is that the, after that tribulation, he comes and there's the millennium. And there's different views of the tribulation among the pre-tribulational types. The, the amillennialists typically assume that there's some kind of resurrection when he comes back. That makes the marriage supper of the Lamb a snack lunch, I guess. Uh, the pre-tribbers, like ourselves, you notice that is not at the beginning of the Saturday week, some interval prior to, because once the rapture takes place, then is the Antichrist revealed, then he comes to power enough to enforce the covenant. That interval may be one day, it might be 30 years, who knows. And there are those that recognize that the rapture has to occur before the great tribulation, but they recognize the tribulation is three and a half, not seven years. So there's a mid-trib subset of the pre-tribbers, but that's fine. Both the mid-tribs and the post-tribs have to deny the doctrine of eminence. The doctrine of eminence throughout the New Testament causes us to understand that he can come at any moment. And imposing any conditions on that clouds the doctrine of eminence. And both the mid-trib and the post-trib people have all kinds of things that have to happen before he can come back. And uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse used to needle Walter every day that he came to the office. He said, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. He was needling Walter about his post-tribulation position because if you're post-trib, Jesus, you've got at least seven years of stuff that have to happen before Christ can come back. And that's just a way of dramatizing the doctrine of eminence. But it's that interval, I don't know whether it's one hour or many months or days, who knows. Okay, he shall sell, uh, send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. Ah, here comes the big one. When his branch is yet tender, put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. There are all kinds of people writing books that try to make the fig tree Israel or Judah or whatever. No, that they're the vine, not the fig tree generally, but Luke punctures this by saying the fig tree and all the trees. The issue here isn't the fact that it's figs. The issue here is that it's spring coming. When you see the first signs, you know that summer's coming near. That's his basic point. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. I'll come back to this after we've looked at the Luke account. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour... Knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's the way it is in the Matthew account. The way it's in the Mark account is really disturbing. The same equivalent verse in Mark 13, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Now that's quite a verse to chew on. Because that seems to indicate that at least at that moment that he was speaking, Jesus was speaking, there was something his father knew that he did not. And, you know, theologically, you can have some difficulties with that. I thought the father and he were one. That's what he, 
you know, he's going to say a few hours later in John 17. And so, um, or does that mean that there is something apparently that has been withheld for some reason to the Father only? There is a number when the body of Christ is complete that the Father says to the Son, go get him. And I believe that that event is deliberately in the mind of the Father, kept a secret, to catch Satan by surprise. So you do, in, you, I think you in vain trying to second guess when the rapture occurs, because I think the whole thing's been deliberately designed to catch Satan off guard. But this is a troublesome, ver troublesome verse, but in the interest of being complete, I want to call it to your attention, when it says, neither, there's neither the Son but the Father only, that's, that raised some very interesting discussions among theologians about the Trinity. But we'll forego those and go on here. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and to, in the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the, also the son of the coming of the Son of Man be. Now there are most Bible expositors will assume that this allusion to the days of Noah simply means that it was business as usual until the flood came as a surprise. And that's certainly what it includes. There are many scholars, for a number of subtle reasons, believe that that is certainly true, but there's more to it than that. And to really understand this, you can't discuss it intelligently until you've really studied what the days of Noah were really like. And that leads to, to a whole study of Genesis 6, which I'll spare you this evening, invite you to dig into that if you haven't done so, and come to your own conclusions about what is called the angel view of Genesis 6. But let's us move on. There shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. And another account will say there, there are uh, uh, two sleeping in the same bed, one will be taken, the other left. The three, those, those passages put together is interesting because it indicates that Jesus understood that the world was round. Because you got a pre-breakfast chore grinding at the mill by the women. You got men in the middle of the day working in the field. You got people sleeping in the bed at night. So you've got morning, noon, and night at the same instant. So it tells you, it's, it, 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 it's, it's one of the things we take for granted, but I just want to point out that uh, it, 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 it uh, requires an accurate worldview to appreciate. Anyway, but um, wherefore, there, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. That's obviously, an I believe it's an allusion to the rapture. There's different views on this thing. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Don't be confused by the unfortunate translation for a good man. The word in the Greek actually means master, head of the house. Good man here is unfortunate because we assume he's a good man. No, the term really means the head of the house. No more, it's not, it's not, a, it's a, it's not a, a value judgment. He's the master of the head of the house is what the term in the Greek means. Know this, that if the head of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Who is the master of the house? Anyone? Satan, exactly. Who's the thief? Idiomatically. Christ. Sounds strange. Think it through. Come to your own conclusions. Satan's house is going to be, that's, Jesus is going to catch Satan by surprise is the point. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The Son of Man is that thief in the idiom of the previous parable. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler of his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. What's all this mean? Be diligent, moment by moment. There are many, many signs in the horizon that cause us to believe that we're moving into the end times. Okay, if so, it's time to put some urgency about raising the bar in your personal walk, on your faith and your commitments to our king. Make sure that he's not number one on a list of ten, he's number one on a list of one. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, he shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, but in an hour that he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in the next session, I want you to compare carefully Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Are they the same? 
Or was it a different occasion with different audiences and a different emphasis? That's your challenge between now and next week's session.